Go ahead and go online now. So, I've got an important message today to share. Okay, so just want to welcome everyone in person and online today. And this is one of those messages as a pastor. It's not an easy message. Okay, I got to talk about the upcoming election. You know, there, in case you don't know, we have an election coming up on Tuesday. Very important election. I believe it's the most important election in our lifetime. So I need to talk about that. And, you know, just to be really honest with you as a pastor, it's not the easiest subject to talk about because if you say, it's like, it's like trying to preach in a landmine because if you say one wrong word, everyone is so on edge. I mean, if you say one wrong word, if you say the T word, Trump, like, ugh, he's a narcissist, immoral narcissist. If you say Kamala, I don't even know what we would say but about her. <laughs> word salad queen, I don't know, but... We just don't have the best options right now, okay? We don't have Jesus on the ballot. We don't have Ronald Reagan on the ballot, okay? So it, it's very difficult as a pastor to come and try to speak into this time and this election because, you know, for some people who are strong Trump supporters, if I don't come out with a red MAGA hat on, make America great again, someone's going to be offended. And if I don't say, well, Kamala's not that bad, you know, whatever, someone else will be offended. And it's just one of those things where it's like, oh, you know, I just felt the leading of the Lord. I got to speak into this, but it's not something you really, really want to talk about, just to be honest, just, just, just being honest with you. Um, I, just, I just want to share kind of my role as a pastor, what I feel like my role as a pastor is to be as it relates to politics, is I don't want to endorse a political candidate because what happens is if you endorse a political candidate, one side is like, he's the best pastor in the world. And the other side is like, uh, you know, God, you know, why, why you bring politics in the pulpit? My hope is to encourage you to seek the Lord in prayer for his guidance, for him to show you who to vote for. All right. That, uh, I can already feel the tension here. What? Like, oh, you didn't say that right. Okay. I'm trying as a pastor not to be partisan. I have strong political views, but I try to keep those to myself. Uh, for the most part, I want to be kingdom minded and biblically based. Whatever party or candidate most closely aligns with scripture is who I'm going to back. Okay, so I, I, I'm not going to get up here and say this is who I'm voting for because I don't, and you can probably tell if you really want to read between the lines of my message today who I'm voting for, but I'm not going to openly, publicly say who I'm voting for because it is your own decision. And you're going to give an account to the Lord for the decision you make, okay? I just want to give you just an idea. I love Twitter because Twitter gives, or X, formerly Twitter, it gives you a real idea of what the nation is thinking and even what the church is thinking on both sides of the arguments right now. You know, one, one stream on Twitter says, you cannot, this is kind of, I'm just summarizing here of a kind of a thought that is put on there on Twitter, you cannot... I repeat, you cannot be a Christian and vote for a baby-killing Democrat. And then there's another side of the argument. Both who love the Lord and both who are legitimate Christians say, you cannot, I repeat, you cannot be a Christian and vote for an immoral narcissist like Trump. So you're like, okay, you know, just it's just this very complex landmine you're, you're wading through. Now, here's just a... This, this is on my Twitter feed this morning, just to give you an idea of both sides of where this is going in the church. This one, path, this one Christian leader who loves the Lord, who is devoted to Jesus Christ, who is devoted to prayer, I follow him on Twitter, posted this about Donald Trump. Okay, so can we just, let me just say this as we go. Just be careful not to get triggered by anything in this message, okay? <laughs> be careful not to get triggered. Okay, this, this man tweeted church. And it's a picture of Donald Trump. It's actually a video of Donald Trump in a recent campaign, the, this election cycle. Church, do we really believe this man is going to fix our, cult, our culture's perverted values, recreational sex, and sexual, sexual deviancy? Do we not see how this life, do we not see how his life of unmitigated perversion has helped shape the very culture where this Sodom-like thinking thrives? Now, he's got a video of Donald Trump <clears throat> performing or, or, or imitating a sex act in a, uh, in a political campaign. 
And he and goes on to say, do we actually believe that a man who performs a sex act on a microphone in front of thousands of women, children, and church leaders is unwrongly accused of rape, molestation, sex with a porn queen, collusion with a notorious sex trafficker? Okay, that's one side of people who love the Lord with their whole heart and are devoted to Jesus Christ. The other side of the argument from someone else who likewise loves the Lord, who likewise feels a conviction to speak out for the truth. It was this, this is about three tweets down to this morning when I'm reading this and I'm going, oh my gosh, and I got to talk about this today. If your pastor doesn't make clear tomorrow, this, I guess he tweeted this last night, from the pulpit that you are to vote against the child killing and pro-sex trafficking democratic ticket you have an obligation to leave that church and take your tithe with you. And this guy's not a pastor, by the way, so he doesn't know the nuance of being a pastor. Christians, this is on you. Okay, so I, I now have to speak into this, this complex, nuanced landmine of politics in America and this day and age in which we live because this election, in my opinion, is the most important election of our lifetime. I've been saying that since about the year 2000, and I believe every one of that, those statements have been true. This is the most important election of our lifetime. And we've got, you know, just, so that, that, that's, that's the Trump side and the Kamala side. You know, you've got the Democratic Party having abortion vans at their conviction, convention, so you can go and have an abortion as you go to the convention. You've got Kamala at a rally where someone shouted out, Jesus is Lord. And you, you may have heard this or not heard this, but she, someone shouted out, Jesus is Lord. And Kamala said, hey, that's not part of this convention or this, this rally. You need to go to the smaller one down the street. So okay, we do not have Jesus on the ballot. We do not have Ronald Reagan on the ballot. So what do we do? What do we do as a church? What do we do as the church? Now, keep in mind that, you know, we're speaking to a larger audience online as well. But here's where I'm coming from. 32 million Christians, there's a survey done by Barna, 32 million Christians have said, because of what I just described to you, the, the choice A, Choice B, we do not have Jesus or Ronald Reagan on the ballot. 32 million Christians have said we're not going to vote. 32 million Christians. Okay, I, I get it. I, I, I totally get it that this is a hard election and a hard thing to, to vote for. And I get it why you may not want to vote. And you, you might even feel self-righteous about that. But your vote really does matter. Okay. It is irresponsible as a Christian not to vote. Even Christianity Today, which has like influences millions and millions and millions of people, was, wrote an article recently and said, basically, it is okay for you as a Christian not to vote. And I, I absolutely disagree strongly with that, is you've got to make your voice heard. And God is looking at your choice in this election of how you will vote, and you will give an account to the Lord of the judgment seat of Christ for your role in this election. Okay. Your vote matters, okay? If, if you want Kamala to be elected, then it's okay to not vote because statistics have shown that if Christians don't vote, Kamala or the Democratic Party will be elected. So if you want her to be elected, then it's okay not to vote. If you're not okay with that, then you need to vote, okay? You need to vote. This, even in the last election, in the last election, 40 million Christians did not vote. 40 million Christians. 40 million Christians who are meant to be salt and light in the culture said, we are not going to vote. And this election was decided last year, last cycle's election was decided by 42,000 votes. That means Joe Biden is in the swing states won by a, by a percentage of 0.7%. Listen, your vote matters. Your vote matters. Your vote matters to God. And you will give an account for how you voted in this election. Okay, so it's very important that, that Christians fulfill their civic responsibility to get out and vote. See, because we, we, we just think, okay, well, I don't like either of the candidates. I remember watching the presidential debate, the, the only one they did, and I turned it off after 15 minutes. I was like, this is awful. I'm like, you can't even carry on a conversation, and it was just so bad. 
And I turned it off after 15 minutes and didn't even watch it. I watched some clips, but I was like, God, we've come to this as a nation, okay? But listen, you're, as a Christian, you're, you're, responsi- you're responsible to vote, because not only will the president, say we're not, you're not just electing a president, but everything the president will uh, do and all the people he will hire in his administration, that, that you got to make sure, are they going to hire the right people that are going to carry out what mostly resembles the kingdom of God? Now, we have to stretch a lot to see what's mostly going to resemble the kingdom of God, but I do believe there's one option better than the other. Okay. So voting really does matter, okay? It really, really does matter. I believe it's very true. Not to vote is to vote. Not to vote is to vote. And researchers said this in this article where they said 32 million Christians are not going to vote or or expected not to vote. These researchers said that if that holds true, then it's most likely that uh, former President Donald Trump's re-election is less likely in Kamala Harris's campaign is going to succeed. So if you're okay with that, then you cannot vote. But if you are not okay with that, then you need to vote. I think you need to vote either way, but you know, that's just something we need to understand is, is we, we really, really need to vote. Okay, a, a pastor on Twitter said this. He said, Trump and Kamala are our two options. You may hate that, but that's the reality. One of them is going to be president, And that person will make thousands of decisions that will affect the direction of the country, my family, and my neighbor. Neither are likely Christians. If I want to participate, I'm voting for one of them, not as a universal endorsement of them, okay? Your vote does not mean you universally endorse every single thing they stand for, but with as much wisdom and as discernment as I can about how they're going to govern the things that I care about or that he mentioned above or the things that he cared about. Okay, just want to just help, just drill this in a little bit, okay? The effects of not voting. Who do you think right now is running our nation? I have no idea. I can tell you one thing, it's not Joe Biden. He doesn't have the mental capacity to run our nation right now. So someone is running our nation. I don't have a clue. I mean, I have some ideas, but I won't reveal them in this message because you'll think I'm a conspiracy theorist. But we won't go there. Who is running our nation? It's most likely the people who he hired in his administration when he was elected. So my point is, is you think, okay, I don't like either of the candidates, but who are they going to hire? Who are they going to hire? The the, the president is going to appoint roughly 4,000 people to positions within their administration, okay? And that's going to carry out their policies throughout the entire nation. So this is one of those, this is, in my opinion, this is one of those elections where policies over character really matter because the people they hire are going to influence the direction of the nation for the next four years, okay? The president is going to appoint between 100 to 300 federal judges that's going to shape the the direction of this nation for, for many, many years to come and even into our children and grandchildren, okay? Just, just to say this about Donald Trump, okay, you may hate him, you may like him. Donald, if you, if, you, if you believe that abortion is sin, which I absolutely do, if you believe abortion is murder, which I absolutely do, Donald Trump has done more for the pro-life movement than anyone else in, in, in history by, by appointing judges that overturned Roe versus Wade and brought it down to the state level. Okay, so as much as you may not like his character, as much as you may not like the the things he says or the the way he treats people, he is absolutely, this is just a fact, he has absolutely done more for the pro-life movement than anyone else in history, even Ronald Reagan. Okay, because whoever is elected president isn't just running the office. They're hiring a full administration of 4,000 people who are going to appoint judges to make decisions. And we've got to, as Christians, say which one of these two candidates, which one of their values are most closely going to align with the kingdom of God. Okay. That is kind of the, that's kind of the situation we find ourselves in. Now, we've got to understand in our nation, 
Our nation is not a democracy. Our nation is a constitutional republic. Now, it's, it's similar to a democracy, but it's different. Just to give you an example, uh, just, just I'll, I'll make a real quick example here. Okay, so imagine, just imagine here that, that a high school is going to vote, and they were going to vote, okay, should we have a homework-free day on Fridays? In a democracy, in a pure democracy, if the majority wants that, then it's decided no homework. In a constitutional republic, which we are, that even if most of the students said, we don't want any homework, there could be a rule in the constitution of the school that says teachers have the right to assign homework as they see fit to ensure that students learn. So even in a democracy, there would be no homework on Fridays. In a constitutional republic, we have a constitution that governs the nation so that, the, that we have every, like even lesser groups have individual rights. So we're not, does that make sense? We're not, a, we're not a pure democracy. We're a constitutional republic. Our government, Abraham Lincoln said this absolutely incredible in the Gettysburg Address in 1863. He said, we, America is a government of the people, by the people, and for the people. See, when, if a Christian abstains from voting, they're abdicating their responsibility. And what happens then is... When you are irresponsible, your irresponsibility becomes someone else's responsibility, and that then is then passed to your children and your grandchildren. To not vote is to vote. We need to get out and we need to vote. Okay? We are a constitutional republic. Now, how do we as Christians in this constitutional republic, because our citizenship is not or I say it this way, our citizenship is in the kingdom of God first, and then it's in America second. That does not mean that, you know, like Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. That does not mean that, some, some people interpret that when Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. Some interpret that to mean we are only focused, we're only called to be focused on the eternal kingdom of God and all this other stuff is going to hell anyway. All this other stuff is going to be destroyed when Jesus returns and therefore I'm not going to even get involved in any of that. That's not what Jesus taught, okay? He taught you are to be salt and light. So live as, um, as kingdom of God Christians in a constitutional republic, we are called to function as salt and as light, in other words, we are to say, we are going to bring, now listen, we cannot, we, we cannot function as salt and light in culture until we have the value system of the kingdom of God in our own hearts. Now that doesn't mean we can't have some effect. That doesn't mean you got to wait, oh, I got to wait till I have a pure heart to until I vote. That's not what it means. But it, it does mean that, that we, we really can't be salty and we really can't be light as the church unless we first have what Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount is true in us, that we are obeying the Sermon on the Mount. I heard another pastor on Twitter, he was saying, you know, I mentioned like, if you, you can't be a Christian if you vote for the ba baby-killing Democrats. You can't be a Christian if you vote for the narcissist Trump. And he said, well, you can't be a Christian if you don't obey the Sermon on the Mount. He was kind of countering that, those two political arguments now, I don't believe that obedience to the Sermon on the Mount is a requirement for salvation. I believe it's by, by grace alone, through faith alone, apart from works. But as a Christian, you are, Jesus expects you to obey the Sermon on the Mount. It's not an option. It's not just a suggestion. It is absolutely the mandate of the Lord Jesus Christ that you obey the Sermon on the Mount, that you obey the Sermon on the Mount, that you live by the Beatitudes, that you live by the moral law from the heart and then you function as salt and light to preserve the culture from decay to say which in this, in this election of the lesser of two evils will best align with the value system of the kingdom of God. That's how I think the church is meant to function in a constitutional republic as kingdom-minded, Christ-centered, kingdom of God first Christians in this nation. Okay. The Beatitudes, you know, poor in spirit, mourning and over sin and brokenness. I love what we were singing today, mourning over sin and brokenness. And I just, I, I just have to say it this way, 
The two candidates we have are a reflection of the condition of the church. And the, the church, the church not being salt because we have failed to obey the, 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 the Sermon on the Mount. We're not living the Sermon on the Mount lifestyle and we have an influenced culture with Jesus' very own words. Being poor in spirit, mourning over sin and brokenness, meekness and humility, hungering and thirsting to be righteous, loving mercy and showing mercy, having a pure heart undefiled by sin and unbelief, being a peacemaker who unites rather than divides, suffering persecution for the sake of righteousness. That's the Beatitudes. In other words, what Jesus is saying is before, and he said you need to be salt and light in the Sermon on the Mount, before you can be salt and light in culture, you need to be a person who is developing the Beatitudes in your heart. And again, if you're saying, well, I don't, I'm not doing that, I'm not going to vote, that, listen, still, you, you, you should vote based on that even if you're not doing it right now. But you should, after the election, say, okay, I'm going to, or even after today, I'm going to start living this Sermon on the Mount lifestyle because that is the kingdom lifestyle. That is the kingdom culture. That is the value system of the kingdom of God. <clears throat> Jesus also taught in the Sermon on the Mount that we are to obey the moral law, God's moral law that is universal and eternal, that never changes and has been from Genesis all the way to Revelation and will continue into the eternal ages. God's universal eternal moral law, we must obey not just from abstaining from it physically, externally, but we must obey it from the heart. That was what he was teaching in the Sermon on the Mount. Do not be angry. Do not be angry at your brother. Do not call your brother a fool. Do not let bitterness rise up in your heart so that the anger in your heart be actually becomes a murderous action. So Jesus is saying, that he's really hitting on the, sixth, the, the, uh, the number six commandment, do not murder. And he's saying if you want to be really uh, be a kingdom-minded Christian, one who's really my disciple, then you need to make sure that in your heart there's not bitterness or anger so that it doesn't manifest into murder. Now, we do have in this election an issue about murder, and it's called abortion. So as Christians who are functioning as salt and light, which of the candidates best uh, aligns with this value system of the kingdom of God, do not murder. Abortion is murder. Rejecting lustful thoughts. That's what he said. Basically saying that, that it, you know, the, the seventh commandment is do not commit adultery. But Jesus is saying that if you look at a woman or you look at a man to lust, you've committed adultery in your heart. That, that we are to, to, that he was condemning any sexual act outside of the covenant of marriage. And so we're to bring that sexual ethic into this election. <laughs> Good luck with that. <laughs> and say, which one best reflects that? I don't know if either one of them best reflects that, to be honest, but maybe. Marriage, the, the sanctity of marriage. That's what Jesus was hitting on in this election. Or not in this election, a Sermon on the Mount. Yeah, he's becoming political. Uh, honoring marriage between one husband or one man and one wife for life. And, you know, the, the sanctity of marriage. So our allegiance is to God, but we're called to be salt and light. See, believers are called to be salt and light. We're called to obey the Sermon on the Mount and then to function as salt and light in culture. See, what you, you may not realize that sometimes that some people think like salt was just used for flavoring, and that's what Jesus is saying, to, to be salty, to give flavor. But actually in the ancient world, in the, the world in which Jesus lived, salt was essential for preserving meat. They didn't have a refrigerator they would put their meat in. They, what they did is they took salt and they rubbed it into the meat to slow down the bacterial growth and the, the, the decay of the meat. And so salt was essential to prevent decay in the meat. And so what Jesus is saying, coming up out of this Sermon on the Mount, the Beatitudes and keeping the moral law from the heart, he's saying, Christians, you're meant to prevent the culture from decay. You're meant to be like that salt in the ancient world that was rubbed into the meat that prevented the meat from spoiling. 
Listen, if you haven't realized since for the last probably 10 years, our culture in America has absolutely fallen off a cliff. When you have the president of Russia, Putin, calling out the decadence of America, you know you have a serious problem. You know you have a very serious problem when the, the leader of Russia is calling America basically hedonist. And I can't argue with them. You know the church is in, you know the church, we are in this condition because the condition of the church for the last 50 years. We have, we have stopped obeying the Sermon on the Mount and therefore because we have stopped obeying the Sermon on the Mount, we have lost our saltiness to prevent the culture from going into decay. So if we really want to turn our nation back to God, it does not begin with electing a candidate in this election, though we need to vote. And we need to vote which, which candidate best aligns with the scriptures. Where it really begins is with the church turning back to God in wholehearted obedience, realizing that obedience is not optional. Obedience is mandatory. It's not a suggestion. Obedience to the uh, Sermon on the Mount is the vital requirement Jesus gives to those who follow him, to those who are saved. <laughs> See, we've got to understand our role. And voting is one of the most essential ways we can be salt and light, along with prayer. I mean, some, some Christians are called into the political arena, arena. But if you're not called into the political arena, one of the ways you can fulfill that role of salt and light in culture is by voting, is by praying. But definitely in this context, voting. Jesus goes on to warn in the Sermon on the Mount, if the salt has become tasteless, how can it be made salty again? And he goes on to say that it is good for nothing but except to be thrown out. And he says, it is trampled underfoot by men. When the church abdicates its responsibility in culture, another entity, satanically empowered, comes in to fill that vacuum. That's why our role, church, is so vital in this, in this nation. We cannot, we cannot uh, shun our responsibility. We must be salt and light in the culture to prevent decay. We must be, we must be that salt that has not lost its flavor. How do you lose your, that flavor? By living in the flesh, by living in the broad way that leads to destruction, by not obeying the Sermon on the Mount. If the church in America wants our nation back to be what it's meant to be, we're not talking about a theocracy, that's not happening until Christ returns. We're not talking about that, but we're talking about what the church, we're not talking about the seven mountain mandate where the church is called to take over the mountain of politics. That's not coming until Jesus comes back. What I'm talking about is salt and light and culture, that we're influencing culture with the kingdom of God because not because we should, but because that is what we're living. Because, listen, if the church loses its saltiness by not obeying the Sermon on the Mount, a vacuum is created, a void is created, and other entities, other political figures, other, and most of them demonically empowered, will fill that vacuum. And that is exactly what has happened in our nation over the last 50 years. This election is a reflection of the condition of the American church in terms of character, in terms of integrity. We have, we, th this, this should be the prophetic message. Like what is God speaking in the election? Well, Trump's going to win. Well, Kamala's going to win, whatever. Hope, thank God I have not seen Trump prophecies like we did in 2020, okay? That was an absolute embarrassment. But if you want something really prophetic, from the Lord, what is God saying in this election? The prophecy to the church in this election is these two candidates are a reflection of you, church. I remember, if you haven't seen the movie Reagan, I highly recommend that movie. But watching that movie, I was like, oh, man. Listen, where has that gone in our nation? I mean, just seeing, if just, just looking at it, just to see how God raised up Reagan to stand against communism. And you, you can see the whole movie, but you can see clearly God, I'm not saying Reagan was perfect or anything like that, but to see that God raised him up to take a stand against communism. 
and the way Reagan was raised up to take a stand against communism, okay? And, and just to see, okay, now here we are in this election, and we're, got, we're basically having to vote for the lesser of two evils. It's like, where are the Reagans? And it's like God is saying to the church, no, these two candidates reflect you, church. This is a reflection of the American church and who we have become because we've, we have failed to obey the Sermon on the Mount. Again, that does not mean we can't vote. We not, we're not supposed to vote. We need to vote, and we need to vote for the lesser of two evils. But I'm just saying, this is a reflection of who we have become in America, the American church. Okay, are you offended with me yet? <clears throat> I'm sure... I heard one pastor say this. It was really, really good. He says, when it comes to civic responsibilities in the church, think about elections in three different tiers. Tier number one, or tier, no, I say start from the top down. Tier number three is opinions. These are issues where the Bible is silent, like interest, what should interest rates be, or mail delivery schedules, or infrastructure spending, or trade agreements, or how we pres preserve the environment, or public transportation. The, the scriptures don't really speak into these things. These are opinions that we are free to debate and to discuss. Tier number two is wisdom. These are issues where the Bible speaks to the principle, but not really the method. Like, for example, like... Um, we can debate how to best achieve the goals, but it's more like this is wisdom, like how to care for the poor, how, what health, how health care should be structured, how environmental stewardship should be done, or how the immigration policy should be set up. Those are, again, subject to debate and subject to discussion. But tier number one, and I believe this is what this election comes down to in this, this time and season right now, tier number one is obedience. There are clear moral issues like the sanctity of life, like marriage, like biblical sexuality, like religious freedom. This also, listen, I'm going to get into this in a minute. This also includes, this is a huge one right here. This also includes maintaining national sovereignty with clearly defined borders and boundaries, resisting Satan's plan for a one world government. I'm going to talk about that in a minute. I believe that's the number one issue in this election. Is we don't debate these, we obey as a church. These are thus saith the Lord's and cannot be compromised. See, this election is unique because this election is really about tier number one. It's really about some thus saith the Lord's. And I believe the two most important ones, and I'm going to get to this in a minute, but I believe the most important uh, issue in this election is not even the sanctity of life. Okay, I'll explain that in a minute because you may disagree. It's globalism. Because if we lose national sovereignty, if we lose the constitutional republic upon which we are founded on, we will never have any hope of the sanctity of life. Okay? If, the, if, if we give our national sovereignty to the UN, their abortion policies are going to rule the day in this nation. We'll have no hope of ever overturning them. So yes, the sanctity of life is vital, but if we lose it to globalism will have never hope of ever getting that back. Does that make sense? I'll explain that more in a minute. So in this election, as our role as salt and light, our vote should reflect what will best preserve society from decay, particularly in these tier one issues of sanctity of life, sexual morality, national sovereignty. And that's why when we vote, we got to make sure, okay, our... Are, are we standing for what the scripture says here? So let me talk now what I believe is the, this is to my, in my opinion, this is, in my opinion, this is the number one issue in this election. Our, this election is not about left versus right. It's not about conservative versus, versus liberal. It's not about red versus blue. This Election is about globalism and the plans of Satan for a one world government versus God's plans for a sovereign nations. Okay? If you don't understand this issue, you will not understand the, the, the real crisis this, this election is about. I remember in 2017, we, we, took a, we went to visit our friends in Germany and we were doing, we were doing some life school training with their students. And they also were called life school 
And we were able to go to uh, Strasbourg, France, which was about an hour away from they, where they lived. And we went to the European Union where they have, it's in Strasbourg, where there, there's two different headquarters of the European Union, one in Brussels and one in Strasbourg. And we went to the European Union in, in Strasbourg. And the, if you've ever seen the building, I don't know if you've ever seen the building, the European Union building in Strasbourg, it's basically modeled after the Tower of Babel. It was modeled after a painting of the Tower of Babel. And the leaders of Europe said, we are going to complete what they never finished. Purely the spirit of Antichrist is in this European Union. And so much of what we're seeing in globalism is coming out of Europe and empowered by the spirit of Antichrist. And so I remember seeing that going, oh, Lord, I've never seen something so blatant as that. And when I got back, I started researching globalism and researching about all the, the push for globalism after World War II. Really, for the last 50 plus years, there's been a, a major push for globalism to create a one world government where nations lose their national sovereignty, where borders, there's no longer any borders, but every, there, it's just one world government, where it's one world government, one world religion, one world economy. Listen, if you've read scripture, you know where that's headed. That's coming. That's rising up right now. And now through the UN and their 17 goals of sustainable development, if you've seen those sustainable goals of 17, or 17 goals of sustainable development, those goals, they sound so incredible. They sound like utopia. It basically means a one world government, a one world economy, and a one world religion where nations no longer maintain their sovereignty. That is what's on this ballot in this election. We've got to understand that. We've got to understand the times in which we live. The spirit of Antichrist is rising up. And scripture talks about this in the book of Daniel, in the book of Revelation. There is a... Um, John called it the, the seventh kingdom. Daniel called it the kingdom in Daniel chapter 7. Out of this kingdom, out of this Antichrist kingdom, will arise ten kings. And then later will arise the Antichrist. But it comes, what, what happens is, I think it's Daniel 7, 24. It's first the kingdom, this Antichrist kingdom is established. Then ten kings rise up. Then the Antichrist rises up. So I want to alert you right now, this kingdom is rising up. It's not there anywhere close to fullness. It's, not, it's only in its infancy. But it's rising up and it's trying to influence this nation. And believe me, you, are not, you will not want to lose our national sovereignty. You will not want to lose our constitutional republic. And we're on the verge of losing that. That's why this election is so important. So you may not realize, you may not have heard about this, but the World Health Order, the worth, speaking in tongues, the World Health Organization, who, the who, has proposed a pandemic treaty that they're going to try to get enacted in 2025 of May. That treaty basically says that a nation has to give over their rights as a nation, their national sovereignty when it comes to a global pandemic. That means that the who is going to decide what vaccines you take. The who is going to decide what, whether or not you have a digital ID that tracks your vaccination schedules. The who is going to decide where you can travel and where you can go, whether, what the lockdowns are going to be like. The who is going to decide that, not our nation, not even our state. And, and so I'll, I'll even, even like Russia is opposed to that. Again, you know you're in a dark place if you're agreeing with Russia. <laughs> Russia did not sign on to this because they're trying to maintain their national sovereignty. They see where that's going. We, we, if you read scripture, you see where that's going. But one, and, and when it comes to this election, one candidate is strongly pro-America and one candidate is strongly in favor of this one world government, this, this UN and WHO. So when it comes to voting, I believe, listen, we may not like the candidates, we may not like you know, these things and those things. This is what is at the heart of this election, is will America more and more progress towards this one world government? 
This seventh kingdom from which the Antichrist will come out of, that is rising up right now. Most Christians are to totally, totally oblivious to it. And in my opinion, God has raised up someone to help restrain that in this nation, in my opinion. I believe, I believe it is God's heart for America not to go down that path and unite with this globalist agenda. Because if we do, we are in serious trouble. Serious trouble. All right. Everyone doing okay? <laughs> Little light, light message here, you know. I'm sweating here, so <clears throat> you probably are too. But I don't know if you realize this, but in September of 2024, you may not have heard about this, but it's huge. This is, the media does not report about this stuff. You can go research this, but the media does not report on this stuff because they know the majority of Americans would be outraged by this and would be completely against this. But in September of 2024, the UN gathered all the nations together. You may have seen that in September when the UN gathered the nations and they created what was a pact for the future. And it's a framework for managing large-scale crises called global shocks. In other words, what they, if you really um, go beneath the surface, this is, what, this is what's going on here, is these elite people who run these high-level organizations who are incredibly wealthy, incredibly influential, their basic policy is through chaos we are going to gain control. Through chaos we are going to gain control. And what they're doing here is they're trying to say there's these global crises, a pandemic, a climate disaster, a cyber attack, a war. By the way, we're on the verge of World War III. That's another issue in this, in this election, by the way. They want chaos so they can gain control. The UN wants to create chaos so they can gain control of sovereign nations. And so they created this called Pact for the Future. You can, you can do the research on it. Again, Russia abstained. Now, you might think I'm pro-Russia. I'm definitely pro-American. I'm just saying you're in a dark place when Putin is speaking more logical sense than America on moral issues and national sovereignty. Okay, I'm definitely pro-American, okay? I don't want anyone to think anything else. I'm just saying that's the condition we are in this nation. But I think it was 130 nations agreed to it, including America. And this essentially strengthened the UN and weakened national sovereignty. And based on this election, that strength of the UN will either grow stronger with America's support or weaker. Okay? Globalism is not new. It goes all the way back to Genesis chapter 11. And I think you've seen God's opinion on globalism. We will build a tower that reaches up into heaven, and we will make a name for ourselves. And God's like, no, you will not. And he came down and scattered them across the nations. Globalism is Satan's desire. Well, let me say it this way. Globalism, and when Jesus Christ comes back, is going to be fulfilled because Jesus Christ is going to be king over all the earth. Satan wants to counterfeit that before he comes back to create a one-world government, a one-world religion, a one-world economy. Genesis chapter 11 reveals the beginnings and the origins of that desire, and you see what God thought about it. God's opinion has not changed. No man, even if they, even if they say in Europe, we will complete what they did not finish, God says, no, you will not. But for the church, we've got to understand this, this, this is on the ballot in this election. This is the number one issue. Because if we, if we sign our national sovereignty, if we sign with this WHO treaty in 2025, that will include abortion. This is why I'm saying this is more important in this election than even some of the pro-life. This is a pro-life issue. I guess it's a better way to say it. This is a pro-life issue. Because if we sign our sovereignty for health over to the UN, which is, which is what we're leaning, we're moving in that direction. We need to resist that. If we sign that over, that means the UN will dictate our abortion policies. That means 
It will, be, it will be way worse than Roe versus Wade. It'll be, and not just a federal law, it'll be a universal law of this world. Abortion is, is legal throughout the world. That's why this globalism is the most important issue. Okay? So God's plan, God says, I will resist the end time Babylon. A one world government, a one world economy, a one world religion is rising up. Listen, the very sovereignty of America is at stake in this election. The very sovereignty of America is at stake in this election. Okay? It, that's, that's sobering, is it not? I'm not saying that if, that whatever happens in the election, automatically we're going to, all our rights are going to be signed over. No, that's going to be a slow process. But I'm saying it's going to be greatly accelerated. Depending on, it's going to be greatly accelerated or greatly decelerated depending on this election. So we've got to understand this. Globalism is inspired. Now, let me distinguish this. Globalism, there's, there's a globalism in terms of like national trade and, you know, you, you know, working with different nations. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about coming under the same laws, no borders. Everything's one world. That, that is a, an antichrist ideology that opposes Western civilization, that imposes Judeo-Christian values. We've got to understand these global elites are completely against Western, Western civilization because we embrace Judeo-Christian values. It even talks about them in Psalms chapter 2. The kings and the rulers of the world, they, they want to break off God's fetters. They want to break off God's bounds. They want to break off the word of God that they say is constricted. We want to do our own thing, and God sits in the heavens, and he laughs at them. See, that they want to just get just get the, the values of Scripture completely out of culture. They hate Christianity. They hate you. They hate me. That's what they want to do. And, they, and so they formed an alliance, the, the globalist, Marxist, Islam, Islamist, LGBTQ, secularist, have formed an alliance to try to create this global entity, this global entity to unite the world to, to drive out the, the scriptures, to drive out Christians from culture. It's the Tower of Babel 2.0. So in my opinion, in my opinion, that is the number one issue. You can disagree with me, that's fine. That's perfectly fine. But I'm just saying, this is my opinion after prayer is I believe this is the number one issue in this election. One candidate is strongly opposed to globalism, while the other is in favor of it. One candidate is strongly opposed to giving the WHO, the UN, the World Economic Forum, uh, more power, while another candidate strongly opposes that. Again, you have the choice. You have the choice. It's your choice. My role as a pastor is to highlight from Scripture what I feel the Scriptures say, the values, both the moral values and the, uh, the times we live in related to globalism and national sovereignty. And it's your responsibility not, listen, if anything I said today, not to get offended, not to be triggered, but to humbly go before the Lord in prayer and say, Lord, who are you saying for me to vote for? Okay, who am I supposed to vote for? Because your vote matters and you will give an account at the judgment seat of Christ for how you vote, and I will too. Did we vote with the Lord's mind or did we not? Not to vote is not an option, in my opinion. We must make our, vo our vote known. We must take action, we must vote and we must vote with the mind of the Lord, saying, Lord, how would you have me vote? Because your, vo your, vote, your vote is your voice, and your vote matters. Amen.
Father, we do come to you in the name of Jesus. And thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord, for this time we live in. Lord, I, I just want to pray for everyone that you would give us the wisdom of God to know who to vote for. If we don't know, most people probably already know who they're voting for. But if, if in anything, Lord, if in anything, God, we don't have the mind of the Lord, I pray that you would give us your mind and give us your heart. Lord, so that we could make, we could make a decision. Lord, based upon your mind and your heart, for what you want, what your will is for this nation. Father, we cry out to you in the name of Jesus, <clears throat> Lord, that your will would be done in this election. Lord, my prayer, my prayer, Lord, is that you would get your people out to vote. I pray, God, that we would not, I know we have difficult choices. I know it's not, clear, Lord, it is a difficult choice. It's a lesser of two evils. We're really voting for the lesser of two evils right now. <clears throat> I pray, Lord, that you would just move our hearts, Lord. Move our hearts to vote with your leadership. And Lord, get your people out to vote, Lord, we pray. I pray you would get your people out to vote, Lord, in Jesus' name. And we pray, Father, that your will would be done. Lord, we surrender what we would want. We're praying, God, that what your will is would be done in this election. And we pray that in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. All right, we'll end the online portion. God bless you. Get out and vote.